Uh, hello, how's it going, everybody? I'm Ben from Universal Audio. Welcome back. Happy Monday. Just in time here for another office hours, guys. It's gonna be a really fun one. Uh, talking about one of the subjects that's near and dear to my heart, which is saturation, harmonic distortion, just getting in there, <clears throat> taking the sounds that sound good and making them even better because that's typically what saturation does. But we're gonna dive deep into uh, what saturation is. And then show you guys a bunch of different ways to go about getting it for your mixes, for your productions. Uh, but thankfully, I don't have to do it alone. I brought Drew along with me today. 
What's up, Drew? What's going on? Hey, Ben. How you doing? Doing Good to well, see you. man. I know it's 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 weird to do this as a duo. So this is like a first duo show in a very long time. Matt's out on yeah, vacation so, today, yeah. but uh, yeah, I think, I think you and I, man, we'll, we'll hold on the fort. We'll do them proud. Yeah, yeah. We got good stuff lined up. I think, yeah, people, hopefully everyone will enjoy it. And Matt will be back with us next week. And, uh, yeah, we'll do some more fun stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, so we're going to talk a bunch about saturation. But before we get there, we've got a few a few uh, things to kind of – a little housekeeping to take care of. Number one of which, there was a Luna update last week. Middle of the week. It was, uh, yeah. Version 1.2.2 was released. Uh, so this one, it's uh, primarily – Drew, correct me if I'm wrong. This is a lot of bug fixes with one, yeah. one improvement that – I personally, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take credit for it because I remember submitting the feedback for it multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> the, the improvement was uh, if you guys are using session templates, when you type in a session name and then choose a template, it used to you know forget what the session name was and replace it with the template yeah. name. That no longer is the case. If you've typed in a custom name and then you select a template, your life continues with the session name that you typed. And I'm, I'm, taking, <laughs> I'm taking full credit for that one because I remember submitting Good. that feedback so many times. Uh, but that's all to say that Luna, the, uh, as you guys all know, and I, I see, I've seen some comments this week over on our YouTube videos asking for features inside of Luna. Always keep on hitting the feedback button. Let the dev team know what's important to you guys uh, for them to keep on working on next. Obviously, we just rolled out a bunch of big updates to Luna. So, uh, you know, if you've got stuff that you're finding in the app, hit the feedback button. Let them know what you guys are looking for to happen in there next. Um, and yeah, those, then, bug, those bug fixes releases, you know, those, the bug fix releases are super duper important. So they they might not be super flashy, but uh, they're they're good to have once in a while to kind of pull back from the features and say, hey, let's just you know let's tidy some things up. So they're good stuff there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And then yeah, I guess the you know question for all of you guys at home, question for you, Drew. We're going to be talking about saturation a lot today. So if you had to pick one UAD plugin. Like just like tickles your saturation fancy, what one plugin would you pick for saturation oh over all the rest? God, you know what? I I it's a boring answer, but it's it's the God's honest truth, and that's mm -hmm. ATR one or two. Yep. A, I mean a, ATR one or two. I mean it just it's it's yeah it's super obvious, but it's you know it's on every single session and mul potentially multiple times, and there's just it's just magic, man. It's just magic. <laughs> if you don't have that plugin, you know definitely yep. check it out. Uh, for me personally, it's man, How about you? It, yeah. uh, it's the the Moog filters. Uh, oh yeah. I, and I've actually I've got one of my examples today. I'm going to show this off because it is it's legitimately one of my absolute favorite plugins to overdrive. Uh, yeah. And you know mainly because it's got a filter right after it, which is kind of like that's the yin and the yang right there of like you know you're going to yeah. overdrive, you're going to add lots of harmonics, <clears> and then using the filter to kind of pull that back. Uh, to me, it's just that that is one of the the easiest and most fun ways to add distortion saturation to tracks yeah i'm not going to show it today but I, I i forgot about like but the the moog is like uh tambourine like mm -hmm. percussion a tambourine like tambourine it, believe it sounds crazy but tambourine is one of the hardest things to get right yeah and like the moog and and because primarily even with a great mic and a decent tambourine there's just something about those harmonics that are in tambourines that just are i don't know it's hard to get them to like feel feel like in your you know crisp and lots of detail but yet but warm and not taking your head off so and the mm -hmm. moog is awesome at that so that would that might have that probably would have been third and number two for me would be culture vulture which i'm going to show a couple things today so <laughs> I, I it's just, crazy uh, i mean there's so many the, good ones you know there's so many good ones yeah the, checking out the chat here keenan called out the culture vulture matt's calling yeah. the uh the fatso uh victor's saying oh, culture yeah. vulture 1084 fairchild uh siren yep, yep. 610 atr fairchild is great man uh-huh yeah. Dude, yeah, man. see, they're, we are so they're, spoiled. We, are we so really spoiled. are. We have so just, many tools. There's so many good ones to pick from. Uh, yeah. but cool, but uh, before we dive into really kind of talking about all of the uh, all the stuff we want to teach you guys here today, uh, I do want to bring up a couple of great comments from our videos in the last week or so. Uh, and one of one of the big ones uh, that we just started debuting last week and will continue to be rolling out are UA Live clips. Or what we're doing is we're taking the best, the the top morsel from each one of these live shows. And giving it a little snip, snip, a little trim, trim, and a little, you know, a little pizzazz. Uh, not, not a ton of pizzazz. Just the snip, snip, trim, trim. <laughs> so anyway, you guys. Uh, and the first one we put out was the the side chaining, side chain gating with API Vision. I believe you did this one, right, Drew? Uh, yeah, I think. Yep, I think so. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Uh, side chaining room mics, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this one, uh, Bjorn. It, Long time viewer of the show, I recognize that name and face from the from the live chat oh, here. Yeah. Saying, you know, yep. these these streams are dense with information, tips and tricks. There are hundreds of them on YouTube and more. What a treasure of knowledge. 
We appreciate you, Bjorn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill's saying, great idea with the short clips. Some, you know, sometimes finding tips means searching through the long videos, so this helps get there faster. Hope to see more of these, which you will, Bill. <clears throat> Uh, and then had shout uh, out, uh, shout out to Miles, shout out to Miles for putting oh, yeah. for those for real together. Miles. Yeah, yeah, good job, Miles. And then uh, KB Quest, this is a, this this is a cool comment. Uh, this was on Joe Chicarelli's mixing vocals with the Poltec. Uh, he had a great great little suggestion here. If you guys missed this one, I wanted to elevate it. You know, for this genre, chest frequencies are really important. So we're talking about hip hop vocals here. Uh, so his comment is basically you know getting into that like hundred hertz area. Uh, and even I'll, I find myself doing sometimes with 60 Hertz too, like that 60 or hundred on the pull tech adds back this, like, you know, those seem like very low frequencies, right? Like they seem like they're below where the human voice may actually be operating. But as we've talked about this plenty of times on the show about how the pull tech is one of the most gentle curves of all EQs out there. That hundred that reaches all the way up, but most importantly, it's kind of it's emphasizing some of the proximity effects, some of that chest resonance, uh, and can add a lot of meat and kind of just yeah heaviness and girth as he calls it to the vocal. So shout out to KB Quest, that was a great tip. Uh, thanks for thanks for adding that to it to the video there. Uh, and then last one here, <laughs> this is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, someone speaking of culture vulture, right? Uh, someone commented on the release on the trailer for the Culture Vulture, which you ha if you haven't seen <laughs> it, just yeah. you know what, man, I, I won't be offended. Hit pause on the show right it's now. A gem. No, yeah. It's it's just it's an absolute <laughs> it's a it's a piece of art. Um, make sure you guys check out if you haven't already. Make sure you go watch the Culture, or even if you have watched it, watch it again because it holds up. It's still yeah. hilarious to this day. It's, Leggy did a great job with it. Leggy Leggy just losing his mind. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's so funny. It's music production equipment uh, review. You know, I wouldn't call it a review, but I'm I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy that you're entertained uh, there, Arturio. Uh, so yeah, awesome guys. Well, so that's uh, that's our comments. I think that's all the main updates. Kind of the housekeeping. So correct me if I'm wrong, Drew. I think we can start diving in and really start geeking out here about saturation. And uh, I think probably the best place to start <laughs> this conversation around saturation is what is saturation? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I guess you know the easiest way to think about this is that it's a type of distortion, right? You know, saturation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what that does is, um, and I just I, I found a nice clean picture of this of well, the concept here, right? Of harmonics, right? We're all probably familiar with this, but if you're not, you know, all complex sounds, you know, sounds in the world, instruments and everything are made up of many, many, many frequencies. Um, you know, we have the fundamental and then we have the various harmonics. These are, these are the signals that are, that are, that are sort of related to the fundamental mathematically. So the second harmonic, as you can see, you know, even just visually, you can see that it's twice the fundamental and the third harmonic is three times the fundamental as far as the, you know, the frequency and so forth and so on up the line. And of course, this is something that I, I guess best we know is unique to humans in that humans sort of, we, we, we space, we pay special attention to these harmonics. Um, and from when it comes to music, the harmonics are what build the notes and chords and all that stuff. And if you've studied music theory, then you know all that stuff better than I do. Um, mm. But when it comes to complex audio, right, this is what makes things, this is what allows engineers and producers and artists to reshape their sound by, by manipulating these, right? Maybe we want to, maybe the fundamentals so low that, you know, it's, it, it's on this sound that it's not letting it come through the mix. So we're going to use some of the techniques that we're going to talk about today to alter the harmonic content, alter the harmonic balance here and get it to poke through. So our ears grab, pay special attention to these things and they grab a hold of these harmonics um, mm -hmm. in well, a way and, and it and it alters the sounds, you know? Totally. And that, that's, a, yeah. you bring it up in such a good way. Like that's one of the most important things and one of the most applic uh, best applications of saturation that we're going to be showing here, guys, is like... Uh, a lot of playback mediums, TV speakers, earbuds, car stereo, some you know bad car stereos, boombox. Like there's so many playback uh, speakers that are not as good as he great headphones or studio monitors, uh, and a lot of times low end content, sub bass, kick drums, like these lower fundamental frequencies just get completely lost. Like yeah. you can have <laughs> like I've had. I remember when I first started mixing you know some hip hop tracks, and I was like. You know, it feel great in the studio. Be like, man, that, it just bumps. Like the bass is there, and it feels awesome. And then I would listen to it in my earbuds. And be like, did I forget to? Did I mute the bass track on my yeah. when I exported this or something? Because like it just disappears. Yeah. And a lot of that is just the if they can't physically reproduce those frequencies well enough. If you don't have 
harmonics working in your favor to help you know tell your ear hey there's there's this note is there it's just down below where mm-hmm. your speakers can reproduce it that's one of the biggest and, and uh, most important applications of what we're going to show you guys here today um but you know something else i, I kind of want to point out too is like a, a lot of people there's a lot of words for these things uh you know saturation there's overdrive there's distortion these harmonics we're kind of it's a muddy pool of words but you know typically the way to think about it is like saturation is kind of like the subtle you know adding a little you know a little edge a little crispness to the edge of the signal overdrive is where it becomes really it starts to become really apparent like you start really hearing overdrive the circuit and then it kind of reaches into distortion uh, and of course the final stage you know the the most intense of all the distort it's the metal zone obviously <laughs> yeah it's yep, like, yeah which <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever experienced the metal zone, yeah, then uh, yeah, you know exactly what we're talking about there. <laughs> well, and I love to. I saw some folks here in the in the comments uh, kind of calling out. Uh, we're gonna someone called out like you know using the stressor on one to one. Lots of culture vulture mm-hmm. fans. Six ten. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna actually. You guys are you guys are so smart. We're gonna we're gonna touch on a bunch of these and, and walk through <laughs> a bunch of examples with these. But I, I think a, a, an awesome place to kind of talk about this and to start from because each one of these plugins. They all there are different topologies. There's tubes. There's tapes. There's fets. There's transformers. There's a lot of things that can kind of create the saturation effect, uh, and that kind of imply that. Uh, and Drew, I think you've got a great example here to kind of illustrate what each one of these are doing and what these harmonics really look like, uh, just spectrally. We're going to listen to them in a minute, but yeah. I, I think this is such yeah. a great way to illustrate it for folks to like really get your eyes connected to your ears about what's going on when we're talking about saturation and harmonics. Yeah, I mean, really, when when we talk, you know, when we talk about harmonic altering harmonic content, that's exactly what gear has always done for many many decades. If you if you build a pure digital tool that has no analog modeling, then yeah, you can make it do very cool, clean, surgical things. But the reality is, over the many many decades, we've become accustomed to certain to certain things, right? This is why things like this, right, the six ten A preamp, it's a you know it's a tube preamp. And it, you know, as you drive it harder and harder, you know, you can see that we have both this one, you know, has both even and odd ordered harmonics, you know, above the fundamental. Um, If I were to go over to the 610B, you can see that it's it it is it sounds different, right? It has less upper harmonics um, and potentially more lower harmonics. So these are basically visual representations of why things sound different. Another good example, you know, when we put out the 1084, people asked about like, well, what's isn't this the same preamp? It's the same basic design as a as a ten seventy three, um, but as you can see here, I've got just just running through the mic preamp, the ten seventy three, and then and the ten eighty four. And as you can see, they have they have radically different harmonic uh, structures and shapes. Wait, can you go so back if, go back again one more time just yeah. to illustrate? Because like, guys, this is this is pretty crazy, right? They're like, you know, Oops, we all uh, we all yeah, so, again. You think the ten seventy three, ten eighty four, <clears throat> Neve? You know, it's a Neve preamp just with different EQs. Yeah. No, there's, and you can there's see, more going yeah, on behind mostly, the hood there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so first of all, you'll notice that they favor a little bit on the, you know, on the odd order distortion, just, you know, just the harmonic content up above there. You know, we're, I'm running this, we're running this preamp. We're not saturating this at all. Like this is not, don't think that this is saturation. Of course, this thing doesn't get into saturation mode, you know, until you go, until you go much higher, right? You know, and then you can mm-hmm. start to see things. So we're still, we're still really clean here. Um, but yeah, 1073 uh, has its harmonic structure. And it, it has more upper harmonics than a 1084. So as you can see, 1084, the upper harmonics taper off a bit more. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's really, it's not like, there's not one is better than the other, but it just, that's explains visually. That helps you to understand. They, they're they not the same. They sound a little different. And maybe, maybe the 1073 is something that you, you know, when you're looking for a little bit more, you know, coloration in the top end, that might be a choice as over top of, you know, the 1084 which is focused a little bit, has more of a grunt to it, maybe. So, you you know, whatever adjectives you want to use to describe it, you yeah. just have to play around with this stuff with your with your ears and hear what you think. <laughs> totally. Well, and, the, and this and this kind of goes back to, you know, if we're talking about, like, why do we like harmonic, like, why do we like harmonics? Why do we like saturation, right? You know, so we, we I spoke a little bit about how, like, for low-end energy, how it adds, you know, adding these harmonics on top of it kind of informs your ear of what's happening on down below, uh, but even on stuff that isn't low in, con- or actually, this is yeah, talking about low in content, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, this, yeah, this, yeah, this is a great one to, yeah. to bring up, right? Yeah. 
What's this one? Yeah. So I, as Ben mentioned, right at the top of the show, like this whole idea, right? This whole, you know, one of the things that we, that this is good at, and you might, you know, our, this is one of our plugins, the precision uh, enhancer for the low end. We have one for the high end, one for the low end. And I'm just, I'm going to show you the low end. So now I've dropped my, I've dropped the sine wave down to 50 Hertz. So we're seeing, you know, on the analyzer, we're seeing what that, that 50 Hertz sounds like. And so if you have, if you have this really, this deep subsonic stuff in your mix and it's great on big speakers, like Ben was mentioning, um, but it's, you're having trouble with it translating. Then that's what, that's what a lot of these, uh, bass enhancers are doing. As you can see, as I raise up the effect percentage, you can see that it is adding in 100, 150, 200. Yeah. It's adding in the multiples of that 50 Hertz fundamental. Right. Exactly. So it's making it's and, and like you said, Ben, that's the stuff that your ear now will hear mm -hmm. and 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 associate with the bottom end that you where you that you want the ear to be drawn to and just sort of uh, come together in that way. So this is a really great visual to see what like something like Precision Enhancer HZ is doing. Totally. Um, and and then, you know, a lot of these, like as you're pulling up, like, you know, the 610, the, the 1073, the Studer, 11, like all these classic tools. Uh, another key component of why we like saturation so much and why we're going to spend an entire show talking about it is like this is this is the familiar classic vintage sound, right? Drew, like this is mm -hmm. yeah. when we listen to record, like, all, you know, all of our favorite records, both past and also present, because it's a huge component of, of modern music today, is built around saturation so back in the day it was the you know the limitation of the tools they only had 610s they only had yeah. you know tape machines they you know, fairchild's like the, when studios were stacked up with all these all this gear their goal was actually to try to make it sound as clean as possible but yeah, the tools yeah. were kind of like catching up with them and you know this was a big part of bill putnam senior his innovations in audio the reason why we went from la 2a's into 11 into 176s and then ultimately into 1176s that progression yeah. from tube transformer optical technology into fets uh it was in a, in the search of making clean fast transparent compression but yeah. all along the way it adds these little bit of artifacts that we've like it's just ingrained in our ears and and i love like the way fab um fab dupont talks about this it's it's the culture of our our collective culture of music is yeah with a bit of a bit of mm -hmm. harmonic saturation a bit of distortion is actually like if it's not there it it feels strange like if you were to listen if try to listen to oh, like a rolling yeah. stones record if they took away yeah. all of the saturation you'd be like that's not the rolling yeah. stones that's not motown I don't... motown without satu without distortion forget about it i mean no like, way you know I would, you would have, those... it would yeah. be unrecognizable you you would be yep. like who the, who the beatles who i don't this is, yeah. doesn't sound like the beatles yeah. this sounds like yeah. the plot like the so modern digital you know we're now you know the technology today is incredible you can actually record stuff in one for one perfectly clean no harmonics or saturation yeah but guess what it just it doesn't sound it doesn't feel the same right like yeah people kind of fall into this all the time where they're like man you know i recorded this super clean why doesn't it why why doesn't it hit me the same way like I, like my fa my favorite records do yeah it's, a lot of it comes down to this it comes down to saturation and there's a know, sweetness to some of this there's a sweetness yeah to some of these harmonics and to, and the, to the and then let's not forget the dynamic element right because mm -hmm. that's also big in the digital world if you clean if you're recording perfectly clean into an a to d converter you know like that's you know whatever that that it's it's a perfectly clean signal um but it's but it's it's lacking some of that you know it's not only are we adding harmonics, but we're compressing the dynamic range and compressing the relationship between these so that, you know, when someone says, oh, I want it to sound thicker, there's two things that are happening. Like when you when you when you hit some of these saturators, they are compressing the, the dynamic range, which raises the average, you know, it raises the average amplitude up. But while simultaneously in reinforcing these these harmonics, it sounds thicker, you know, dynamically as well as harmonically. So and, you know, if anyone's wondering, you know, how does you know we're going to be showing a lot of uad plugins today but i just wanted to give a quick shout out to the newest ua interface the volt which you guys if you've if you've been picking up what we're putting down here <clears throat> a 76 compressor and a vintage mode these two you know the same concepts that we're going to be talking about here around saturation distortion and why it's so important to music is why it was so important for them to put into our new usb interfaces 
it's uh it's actually it, it all makes perfect sense and we're gonna we're gonna really kind of break down and get into a bunch of examples here but drew i think let's bring up the uh the vsm because i think this is yeah. a, a great <clears throat> teaching tool uh to really understand second to third or order harmonics so like you know we're just talking broadly about saturation but now let's get a little yeah. specific here about the different types because ultimately i want you guys to walk away with a bit of a memory bank of like Oh, when I want to get this kind of sound, this is the sort of distortion plug or saturation plugin I should reach for over another. Yeah, and real quick, you know, Metropolis America asked in the chat about what's the difference between why between EQ and harmonics. Like what you know, EQs alter harmonic content, but they do it mm -hmm. statically, right? They do it statically and they do it potentially, uh, you have to be in charge of it, right? The You know, you have to pick and choose where to do things. One of the coolest things about gear, right? And the reason why gear has histories and all oh, people love the 1176 and the people love this is the gear is helping you, right? So, um, it, it, you know, so an 1176 does breaks up a certain way. A 1073 breaks up a certain way. So the gear is helping you. Rupert Neve is helping you, right? You know, Saul mm -hmm. Walker from API is helping you. They're, you know, they're, they're literally guiding you by, you know, by by building a piece of gear that breaks up a certain way um and this you know as ben alluded to and ben's going to do some sound examples here i'm just going to show you the visuals of this but this is a great tool um this is the vsm3 if you're not familiar with it it's it's on our platform and it's a great um it's basically a saturator right i mean and and what's cool about it is uh it has different topologies right it has uh of course it's an analog this is a real analog piece of gear of course that we've modeled um and it has essentially two um harmonic generators in it uh one is fet based and it's which is going to generate more second order uh harmonics and then a zener which is a diode type of diode uh harmonic blender on, on on the third side so i'm sorry on the right hand side and what's cool about this plugin is you can assign each of these um you know uh uh modules so to speak to either the mids or the sides in an ms configuration you can also choose for example right here you can choose whether or not you want to uh saturate only the low end the mid the high mid the high and then the full you know the full range which obviously yields quite different results um mm -hmm. but on the and ben's going to show you some of that uh visually but uh, i'm sorry he's going to do, do some demos but i want to just show you real quick visually one of the cool things about this is it has this thd mixer and if you look at the analyzer you can see that when i'm at a 50 50 uh a percentage that we have a mixture of even and odd ordered harmonics. So, but if I if I go to the left and I lean into the second ordered harmonics, uh, you'll notice that the the balance shifts, right? So let me just go back and forth here for you to see how this balance is shifting. Um, so if I go all second order harmonics now, I can choose whether how much I want to drive it. So this allows you to really determine how hard or how how high up or how much how much saturation how much do you want to drive into those we have a a, a a shape control which allows you to you know change the shape of, of what's happening here as i mentioned here if you want to do it to just the low end so now when i drive the low end you're not going to nearly be generating as much high frequency stuff so if you just want to saturate your bottom end it's you can do that you can do that here with just the low button um and yeah, so it's super cool to be able to, to see this. And, and as I said, Ben will show you, uh, do it, do an auditory example, but this is really a great tool. Um, if you, if you, and I like to do this to everything, you know, I'm, I've shown several plugins here. Mm -hmm. One of the first things I do when we, when we, even when we develop a new plugin, it's like, you got to, you know, you put it on the analyzer and it, it helps you to reinforce what your ears are telling you. So a combination of looking at this and sound examples are really, um, a good mixture to be able to yeah, help you sort of train your ears you know totally because yeah it helps to helps to know that you know have a sense of what these things what these tools are going to do but then end of the day it's going to come down to a, a sonic evaluation for yourself right of like what yeah. what actually sounds good in the in it this changes from track to track and from source to source um and so yeah let me let me go ahead and bring up uh, a little audio playback here with the vsm uh, so I figured a great way to kind of illustrate this for you guys and make it as apparent as possible I've just got just some smooth piano chords. That's it. We're just going to go long, sustained piano chords. The great thing about piano for uh, kind of teaching saturation like this is it's got an, it's got an attack, but it also has a sustain. So you're going to be able to hear these harmonics over a longer period of time, and you're not getting distracted by uh, everything. Like uh, I'll show a lot of examples here with drums uh, because, again, 
getting stuff that has lots of transients, lots of energy kind of going into the saturation is a great way to really kind of enhance and show you guys uh, what it is doing. So let me just play back these chords and you'll see I'll turn up. Um, I'm going to start in the second order, but you know, is, as you guys saw on Drew's screen, even when you're on second, you're still getting a little bit of third, right? So like all these, all these analog tools, they're not, it's not pure, just second order with none, none of the third, but it shifts the balance as he showed you. Um, so we're going to start favoring the second order and I'm going to drive the input into the whole processor until it is vividly apparent how much distortion we're getting. And then we'll kind of tweak from there and we'll go between second and third. And I want you guys to use your ears and really listen super hard for what the difference is. And, and, and the difference is going to come above the fundamental tones of the piano. It's going to come, it's, you're going to hear the sharpness. You're going to hear brightness change. Uh, so here, let's, let's take a listen. I'm just going to crank it. To get a little fuzziness. You know, you know if any if any of you have ever used a guitar pedal in your life, <laughs> you know you know what saturation with distortion sounds like. But now let's take it from second up over to third and hear the difference. Listen up top. Listen to like the top edge of that piano. subtle right guys like it's it's this isn't like a wow oh now you know i love second way over third like this is probably the the point i want you guys to walk away from is like both of these are great to my ears the third adds a little bit more high-end kind of just a little bit extra sharpness is typically how i describe it uh yeah. whereas like the second order it, it's a little bit of a smoothness um drew how is that your experience with it as well or how would you describe yeah. it yeah, you know, the, you know, the second order harmonics are those, you know, that we we generally have a pleasing uh, reaction to them when you when you add that second harmonic, it 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 sounds thicker. That's what makes you know it sounds beefier. It sounds thicker. So and generally in a in a in a sort of rounder sort of way, um, you know, I I guess you could use the word pleasing sort of way. Whereas third third is generally more a little less tonal. It's a little atonal, um, mm -hmm. and and when driven too much can be kind of ugly. But of course, you know it's all relative. So if you're blending it in, or if you're only doing a little bit, then yeah, you can actually add just a little bit of like aggression to something with those, uh, with the odd stuff that doesn't read as audible distortion, but just allow something to just sort of poke out of a mix. Maybe the one it wouldn't otherwise. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let me, uh, let me play this for you one more time. And then this time, you know, this sounds like I'm putting the piano through a distortion pedal. Let me bring this back to something that is a little bit more in the vibe of like a classic recording where like I'm not doing this as a hey let's let me smack you guys over the head with distortion effect <laughs> a little bit more of a like yeah like that's how I would want my piano to sound sort of vibe uh, so let's take a listen and, and I'll tweak it for you guys to hear So this is without. And now with. So now you can hear, right? When I when I take it away, you're like, oh yeah, that's that's plain old piano. When I add it back in, there's still a little bit on the edge of it. There's a little bit in the sustain of it. It's just this like otherworldly thing. There's this like, oh man, that 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 piano's seen some stuff. Like that's that piano, like <laughs> It's lived a life. It, it it it's it's been some places. It's seen some stuff yeah. it didn't want to see, but ultimately, like it it kind of grew up and became more mature, and it's it has something to say now. That's it's an elaborate way of saying I love how distortion sounds on pianos and stuff like this. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah. So that is at its at its core. That's a great way to kind of to teach harmonics. Now I think probably a great kind of segue here would be to dive into some specific topologies 
of yeah. different saturation harmonic plugins. You know, so uh, like I said, we got a major food groups. We got tube. We got tape. We got fets. We got transformers. Um, and let's let's they keep things obvious. We're gonna. I think we're today, we're guys. We're gonna work our way from very obvious effects down to more subtle effects. Uh, so couldn't start any more apparent than where I put that piano there at the beginning. <laughs> but another yeah. super apparent one is uh, is everybody's favorite. You guys, a bunch of you guys called this out as your favorite saturation. That is the culture vulture. Uh, and Drew, you got yeah. an example uh, to share with folks? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I got th I got three little things prepped here, and and actually, I, I'm going to do a little bit. Uh, this is a probably a little bit of an or unorthodox version of the culture or, or application of culture vulture, but I love this thing, and I use it on even on really subtle stuff. So, like the first couple examples I'm going to show you are more subtle, and one's on a set of, of drum overheads, right? Acoustic drums on the overhead mics, um, and this I find like this is something that you know. Saturation doesn't have to be, you know, super duper audible. Um, and in this case, you're going to see that um, I, I like it for, for even for things like overheads where it's it's in lieu of a compressor uh, or possibly in addition to it. But like I, I generally do this first, like pretty early on. Um, and let's just listen to the let me just listen to the overheads without it. So pretty basic, you know, overhead overhead vibe, but but you'll notice that you know you got kick and you got hat, you got snare, you got some room ambience. Maybe you just need to pr bring that bring that more together. So this time I'm going to play it and I'll turn it on halfway through. And on. And back off. And you can hear back on. There's just a there's a thickness and a density that gets added that like that regular compression is just not necessarily going to do because you might hear its attack and release time. So mm -hmm. this is you know and, and and I'm on the triode here, which is the 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 even ordered distortion type on the culture vulture. We have pentode one and two. Pentode one is the odd and it's m more aggressive than the triode, and then pentode two is super is way more aggressive. Um, so. Yes, well, so I love a, I love a, that the way that you did that one, dude. Because yeah, you're right. It is. It's a little bit like compression, right? In, in terms yeah. of like you guys. Hopefully, you all heard it too. The forwardness of the kick and the snare. It felt like they yeah. just like they gained 15 pounds. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, which is that's the effect that you're going for. It's not a huge, obvious like smack you over the head. Like, hey, now yeah. I'm distorted my drums. No, it's like a hey, here's a little bit more of what you want from these drums. Yeah. And if you'd have tracked this, you know, back in the day, if you'd have tracked this on a 610 console, you'd have gotten that naturally in the mic pre, or you'd have, mm -hmm. you know, or you tracked on a 10, on a, on a Neve 80 series, you'd have gotten that from the preamp, you know? So in a lot of ways, we're having to put that back nowadays. Yeah. Um, so here's example number two. This one is, uh, so here, here we're moving over to room mics and I'm going to go, uh, oops, not that I want this guy. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, still in the triode, but I'm just, but now I'm on room mics and I'm driving it just a little bit harder and we'll mm -hmm. start without. And with, oh, and this time, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot, I forgot to mention. For this demo, I'm using the filter, right? Mm -hmm. This filter is really great on the Culture Vulture because it allows you to knock, it's a, it's a low pass at 9K and 6K. So on the overhead example, I left the filter off because I wanted full bandwidth into this in, you know, in my saturation. But on these, on these room mics, I don't know about you, Ben, but sometimes room mics, you want the you want the oomph and the girth of the drum, but you don't want the splatter of the cymbals, right? Yep, exactly. So, yeah, so this is a great this is a great tip on using the culture vulture for slight saturation and engaging the nine K filter. And you know, you might say, Oh, well, aren't you aren't you uh, you know, deadening the, the top end? But remember, this is a room mic that's blended in with the overheads and all of the direct mics. So mm -hmm. when I put this in, you're gonna get the, the thickness and the low end and the saturation, but also a reduced top end. softens that hat it's just what you want on that yeah right because you got to think when this is blended in with the overheads i don't need extra top end those overheads are taking care of it for me so i i'm okay with rolling it off mm -hmm. so, so that's just, that's another for, you know 
for the sake of science, what happened? What it, I want people to understand the difference between that tryout and the pinto because we've shown the culture, oh, yeah. culture a couple times, but. Uh, Drew's got this on some very tasteful settings right now. The great thing about the culture vulture is it does this. It does this like very informed, like oh yeah, that's that's what you want. Like that, it's a yeah. uh, you made you made the high you know made the overhead sound a little bit more alive. You made the room sound a little bit roomier and girthier. But you can also you can be very very rude with the culture yeah. vulture. <laughs> so that's what I did over here, right? So a couple things I'll I'll point out here. N number one, I've switched over to bass, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know, uh, it, it, we can go aggressive on this. Um, I've switched over to Pento 2. So this is the most aggressive one. This is also where you can, you know, also, if you haven't done this, have make sure you have some fun with the bias knob because the bias knob is determines how much bias current gets fed into the, you know, the distortion, the tube distortion, and it can either starve or supply extra voltage to that or extra signal to that. And anyway, I'm not electrical. I'm not an electronics expert, but it's cool stuff. So check it out. So first of all, let's hear it without it. We have this a pretty basic. Um, you know, pretty boring bass, right? But we put this guy on it and we're going to, you know, this is going to be significant. So I've got it output level down a little bit. And you'll notice I have the filter at 6K. So this is obviously with bass guitar. You know, I don't want to, you may not want a super fuzzy top end. So I'm going to get rid of some of that top end. And now, and on its own, that sounds kind of ugly, but, and I'm doing it a bit heavy on purpose, but listen to the bias knob. I can have, I can have full bias circuit where it's actually uh, distorting the entire frequency. And then when I, as I starve the circuit of its, of the bias current, it actually will start to a breakup in a unique way. And eventually it'll go away because I've starved it of all of it. You, you know, you can get, you know, I mean, I'm just screwing. I'm just obviously doing it. Obvi I'm doing over the top stuff just to really make it obvious. I'm, you know, it all obviously has to fit in the context of the song, <laughs> but, but that bias knob is super fun to play around with. It, it really is. And like, you know, we, we showed this off, I think uh, last week uh, when we were talking about parallel processing, right. And we were focusing on doing stuff like what Drew just did and then using that mix knob to then blend together yeah. some of your, some of your dry signals, some of your full rich bass along with that kind of top end distorted. And that's where it's so helpful guys to, you know, we're, we're doing these all for demonstration, but this is stuff that I would highly recommend you guys try for yourself as well to really start understanding. Okay. When I pull up the culture vulture, I'm going to, if I want this, what I just heard, if I want that kind of square wavy sort of bass, you know, almost turns into a bit of a synthesized sounding bass, right? Cause it's so squared off pentode yeah. mode and then mess around with that bias until I drop all of the fundamental frequencies away from, from what's getting saturated and then use the mix knob to now get clean. So I'm getting clean low end with harmonically saturated and kind of synthy square wavy awesomeness blended together. Again, these are, these are tools now in your tool belt that you can pull out. You can be like, cool, that's the sound I need to really add aggression or add energy to maybe a, a very normal playing bass part. Um, I think we just gave Bo his band name, Starving Bias. <laughs> Starving Bo <laughs> Starving Bias as is be a, would be a good band name, apparently. I love it. Well, so there's a good question here in the <laughs> chat I want to get to before we keep going forward with the examples. Uh, Will was asking, you know, for layman's among, among us, are we are we trying are we saying that we should add a dBU two of saturation before compression? Uh, so, well, uh, this uh, to me, it's it's not so much there. First of all, there's no rules. It, you know, yeah. These are all just purely uh, guidelines, as Jack Sparrow would say. Um, but you know, really, what we're going for here is is you want to pick and choose your elements. And we talked about this with parallel processing last week too. Pick and choose what needs this extra life, what needs this energy. And you know, a lot of times you'll receive you know tracks that are synthesizer presets or loops, or you may have sources that have already been saturated. They might not need more. Or maybe they didn't saturate enough. So it's really, you got to make the call based on the context of what you're working on. Does it need to sound more vintage? Does it need to sound more forward? Does it need to sound girthier? To, like all these dimensions that you, that uh, as an engineer, you can add to the sounds of your productions, of your clients' mixes. 
uh, you have to do it with some intent. You got to do it with like, oh, there's a reason why I'm throwing the culture vulture on this base right now. It's because it's not doing this for me yet. And the culture vulture is what's going to add that that layer of, of sound that I need to get there. So I'm not going to say there's generally a do this or do that. Um, I guess, Drew, when you, do you do you, saturation before compression, compression before saturation, or does that not really matter if, what order it goes in? Yeah, for I'll say for the most part, like the what I'm the demos that I'm doing today, like those the more subtle ones, it's mm -hmm. part of my it's part of my EQing because like generally speaking, however, there are certain times where I'll put a saturator post a process. For example, Transient Designer, Transient Designer is a plugin I love. I love how we can how you can add attack and so forth. But sometimes it'll get a little spiky, and I'll follow it with a Studer 800, mm -hmm. some or or something that can absorb you know some of the some of that transient and mellow it a tiny little bit. So I, it kind of it kind of depends. But generally speaking, and it's part of that's why Luna. You'll notice Luna, in Luna, the tape extensions are the first thing that the sound hits coming yep. off the multi track, because that's uh that the the tape coming off of tape is the traditional workflow so in that sense you're starting with that kind of saturation and then yeah you're tone shaping from there and then uh you know maybe some compression that has some saturation in it and then who knows you know like you said ben there are no rules um i, I you know i don't be afraid to experiment don't ever think oh that doesn't look right uh, you know or i don't think i'm supposed to do that like you literally just have to you know you have to go and trust your instincts. Larry asked the question in the chat. He asked about, will parallel saturation create phase? Um, and the answer is anything you do to audio in parallel or even anything you do to audio frequency re related is going to manipulate, change the phase, right? EQing is phase shifting. Um, you know, that's why, of course, we have linear phase EQs that attempt to time align and compensate for the phase shift that's occurring. And they can be great in the right context. But for most single channel stuff, you don't want or need linear phase stuff. But the reality is, is that Ultimately, no matter what you're doing, if it's a net gain, mm -hmm. then so be it. Go for it because phase is frequency dependent. And so, what some as you add parallel saturation, you could you're throwing things in and out of phase across the entire frequency range multiple times. But the net result is just does it sound good, right? You know, that's we, it. You know, we've talked about this before. We know Joe Ciccarelli's done several videos for us recently, and. I mean, Joe's just, he's just a badass. He's a ninja. I mean, like he just, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, but you look at, sometimes there's clipping happening. There's meters are clip. It's like, who cares? Right. Just yep. does, is he, is he adding vibe? You know, is he, is, and he is always, you know, totally. Uh, yeah. and then uh, it's a very, very important question, uh, from, uh, Hooters girls loves me, love Hooter girls love me. Uh, I was wondering, <laughs> where do I get the culture vulture? I, we've been talking too much about the culture vulture without really addressing the main fact, where do you get it? Um, so uh, it's in the UAD library, guys. Uh, if you're if you're trying to find it inside the UAD store, uh, go to categories. Special processing is the one to pull up. You'll see it's right there on the top on the top line. And a lot of the ones that we're talking about here today are uh, are here inside of the special processing. So you got the Fatso Precision Enhancer, which Drew was showing uh, a little bit earlier. You got Oxide, the Tape Bundle. Uh, so a lot of really important, very creative, awesome plugins are in there. And another one, uh, you know, as we're kind of talking about topologies here, right? So, uh, so Drew just showed us tubes. The next one I wanted to jump to was FET technology. So, uh, FETs, and I'll, I'll we'll go through a few of these here. You know, you got this, uh, the eleven seventy six is based on a field effect transistor. It's a type of, uh, you know, it's basically a, a circuit component. Is is really what this is. But the way it breaks up, the way it squares off and saturates signals is very unique and special. Uh, and I, I think I, I hinted at this at the beginning of the show. One of what's my favorite saturation plugin? It's one I got on screen here right now. This is uh, the Moog Multimode Filter. There's uh, <clears throat> there's three different versions in the UAD catalog. Uh, there's this one. There's the SC, uh, which is a little bit. It doesn't have quite the same saturation harmonic characteristics. And then there's the XL, which is has sequencers and it's. Uh, I use that one a lot, but I also use this yeah. one a lot because it's a little bit simpler. Yeah. Um, and for today's example, this is exactly what I needed. Similar to what Drew showed you guys on the Culture Vulture, one of the main reasons why I love this plugin is because not only am I getting an incredible saturation kind of overdrive out of it, but it's immediately followed by a Moog filter, which you know, you're going to hear. If I leave the filter completely open, harshness kind of starts coming through pretty quickly. So being able to like add a bunch of harshness and saturation, but then filter it down and, and chill it out a little bit 
to me, like this is it's like the perfect combination of of, of what I want. So uh, I'm switched from piano to uh, a, a drum loop in here. I'll just play it for you guys clean first, and then we'll kick in the uh, the saturation. Yeah, let me just turn that up for you guys a little bit. Feels a little low. There we go. All right, ready? You guys ready? We're ready. Man, I can hear that, hear the shells in the room. I can smell everybody's stank faces at home right now. Because like the <laughs> minute you turn that on, it's hard to not go, ooh. Mm. <laughs> All right, so what are we doing here? We're driving it, guys. So here, I'll, I'll, I'll play that again. I'll make less faces, but I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you the controls that really matter to this, which is the input drive and the filter uh, cutoff. So I'll roll this back down a little bit to something a little more, you know, a little bit more. Uh, yeah, a little more tame, but then I uh, also really want to focus in on this filter. So you can hear, you can hear it. Like I've brought the drive down by half. It's still, it's still doing something really cool and special to it, right? And a lot of that it does have to do with this filter. This is kind of. If you're if you love low if you love break beats if you love lo-fi drums, the difference between having this filter kind of all the way open here and just just kind of just controlling those hi hats a little bit, and of course if you, you can, I've got this in two pull mode, which is a gentler filter. I can switch that to four. See how it cuts it makes an even sharper cut to those hi hats. can increase the resonance. Sometimes I'll do this where I'll use the resonance to really be, uh, help me with that, get that point on the snare and the hi-hats. So let me exaggerate this for you guys. So you can hear it's on the hi-hat right now. Let me pull it down a little more towards the snare. And let's drive into that a little harder. Is that the drummer making noise at the head uh -huh. of that? <laughs> That's awesome. So now, now with a filter kind of really down on the hi hat and the snare, but with the resonance up, I'm getting this peak there. But then I'm getting all this kind of girth and size on the kick drum. And as he, and as Drew's mentioned, like is, this is essentially I've now very, I've hyper compressed the signal. I've made a very you know I'm driving into it so hard that the moment the transients hit, they're clipping and rounding out. But in a really chill way because of this, because I'm I've got a 3K filter after it, um, so I can't say enough good things about the Moog multi mode. I could sit here all day showing you guys tricks about the multi mode filter. Uh, I believe 99% sure I did some of these tricks in the five minute tip video about the Moog XL. If you haven't checked that yeah. one out, go check that yeah. one out because uh, this kind of goes from what I just showed you guys to like the next level because you can add in sequencers, you can kind of do really cool effects modulating, you know, you can use LFOs, use step sequencers to really mess around with that frequency as well as the drive. Uh, but I do want to highlight a couple other FET uh, processes and I'll just, I'll bring them both up here at the same time because they're related, they're similar, they're in the same family, same vibe. We got the 1176 and the Distressor. So I'm gonna start with the Distressor because uh, you guys, you may have ne you may have never noticed that this was in here because you're constantly like distressor compression. Let's go. There's the thing. There's a setting one to one that you can get on the distressor. What is one to one? That means there is no compression. It's just working as a saturation box now. It's working to help you saturate your signals without changing your levels. But I mean. It's going to change your levels because that's, you know, as we just heard with the Moog one, it's essentially compressing your signal by saturating it too much. Uh, but throwing the stressor into one to one mode, yet again, I'm cranking the input. I've trimmed down my output, trying to make this really obvious of an effect for you guys to hear at home. But then uh, as we play this back, I'm going to go in here and mess around with the audio circuit because there are two options. I mean, there's three options I can count. One is high pass, that just, you know, takes out some low end from your signal. Not what we're here to talk about, because we're here to talk about Distortion 2 and Distortion 3. And you're going to hear, again, these are even and odd harmonic emphasis. 
uh, to the circuit. So uh, I'll play this back. I'll kind of switch between those. I want you guys to really hear what the difference is. So yet again, let's go ahead and start with it bypassed, and then I'll bring it in as I play back. It's nice. This is a really good clean loop. I, I, worked, I, I spent a lot of time in Splice finding something that was like cleanly recorded because I knew I was going to mess it up like this. <laughs> Tame, nice. Yeah, that's just a got really a, good one. It's that's just a got a lot, right? The edge, the like, all of a sudden, it sounds like he's hitting everything a little bit harder. He goes from like kind of soft, jazzy drummer to like, ah, oh, funky drummer. I got it. Yep. That fill sounds amazing. That's a great, right. you know, that's kind of indicative of that, what we talked about earlier about older sounding stuff. Like they were getting some of that THD, like not on purpose. They were getting it because the mic was, you know, was barely being able to handle it. The tube was at its edge, blah, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it went through a lot of different circuits. So like, that's a really good AB on just add, like no one would ever that read that as distortion. Cause no yeah. one, by the time the song's out, no one ever heard it without that saturation. So like, it's the only way you know, in, exactly. Yeah. You would only know it that way. You, and that's, we only know Motown that way. We only know the Beatles that way. We only know this stuff, you know, when it was coming out of their mouth, it was crystal clean and clear, you know, but like it mm -hmm. went through these, these chains. Right. So that's a, that's a great AB there, Ben. Yeah. And so, yeah, let me kick it on one more time and I'll, I'll show you guys because the two and the three, they do, they take this to the next level here. Because right now we're just one to one, just driving the input, driving the transformers and the, the circuits inside of the stressor. Now I'm going to take it one step further. So this is, uh, we're in engaged. You can see I'm redlining THD, but now let's go to this two. This two is kind of similar to where it was, right? But now check out three. Even more edge. You can even, you can also mm -hmm. see it in my levels too, right? It's dropped it down. We've now fully clipped out the top end of that. Let me take it out. Kick in the snare. Come back to life a little bit more. So, and by the way, you guys are no, hopefully noticing I'm using a little bit of a trick here on the on the real distressor, right? You only, you have this button where you cycle through all these options. <laughs> One of the nice plug-in only features that you can just click on the name to turn the features on and off, which is uh, very very handy when you're doing ABs like this. And and try and again, I want you guys. I hope you guys are listening really intently and kind of picking up the subtle differences between these ones because it's these are not smack you over you know the overall effect is kind of smacking us over the head but between two and three there's these little edge little differences to like the edge of the sound to the way it's it's controlling the transients uh and especially as you guys heard when i got to disc three it was just you know kick and snare hey no you, no you shall not pass this level right here <laughs> um which adds a different adds a different character to it which you really heard on that fill at the end um but i do want to compare this to the 1176, which can do a very similar sort of thing, guys. And um, you, you may have always wondered, why is there an off setting on the attack? That is because you can turn the gain reduction circuit off and do exactly what I just did with the distressor. Dime the input and then trim your output until, until you're happy. Attack and release don't matter anymore. The ratio doesn't matter anymore. We are purely using the 1176 as a distortion box. Uh, and so by the way, the, the hardware does that, that, you know, it's not a plug in only feature. The uh, at real 1176s, you know, have that switch. Um, I have one right, have it rev F right there. Uh, <laughs> right? So yeah, they, it's not, it's not, that's not specific to the uh, software, just so you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Nono's asking, wait, how are you not hitting the compressor? Uh, I was in the one to one ratio on the distressor. That's how you do right. that. It's it's not hidden, but it's not a lot. And I think on some distressors, this is referred to as British mode. Um, don't ask me where the name came from, but one to one just means no compression, similar to what I'm about to say uh, do here for the 1176. So uh, I'll start with it out, so we can, you know, put in your put in your ear what these raw drums sound like, and then I'll bring in the 1176 and just listen to the edge it's adding to the sound. I'll turn it up a little bit. Just, 
reminds me of what drums sound like on old records. Like it goes from like it's a fine yeah, recording. It's it's a, it's a really it's a great accurate recording. It's very dynamic. Uh, just kind of unusual for a lot of loop drum loops. Uh, it's hard to find drum loops that haven't already had a lot of saturation or harmonic processes to them. But check it out, man. When it goes from very nice drummer. Dude, I, I'm, I'm serious. I could sit here all day listening to this drum loop, kind of tweaking these, trying out. You know, Drew, I know you mentioned like you love the uh, 1176 Rev A to do this yeah. sort of stuff. You can do this yeah. with uh, with the AE version. Like all the 1176, each one of these plugins, man, they all do something a little bit different. And that's why we have so many of them and why we're all, we're all <laughs> you know, all of us UAD users are so spoiled with like the plethora of choice to add harmonics and saturation and energy and life to tracks. Like, we we lit, we are in the golden era of being able to like have all these tools at our fingertips and be able to be very deliberate about what sort of saturation or harmonic uh, ingenuity that we're adding to our mixes um, here these days. Yeah. And wow, yeah, the 1176 is a great example. The the Rev A, the earliest version, like we it's it's actually revered now, and it's the most expensive one on the used market, the Blue Stripe, and it's the dirtiest and it's the grittiest. And of course, when they were selling it people would complain, you know, oh, it's too, it distorts too easy or it has too much distortion, what have you, you know? So of course, you know, UA Bill would, you know, designed separate, you know, cleaned it up, you know what I mean? And got like, got the distortion numbers down and all that. And then, you know, fast forward all these years and people are like, no, I want, I want the dirty one, you know, yeah. I want the, I want the gritty <laughs> one, you know? So it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, good question here from Zach. Zach, so do we put the 1176 into 20 to one? Uh, no, actually it doesn't matter. Zach, uh, the, the ratio does not matter. The thing that matters is on the attack, putting it to the off button in which, uh, on the 1176, the plugin, you'll notice like when you drag the control, it goes down to one to turn it off. You got to deliberately click on the off button. And so now the, the ratio doesn't matter. There's no gain reduction it is taken out of the circuit. So these buttons no longer do anything at all. Um, but yeah, that off switch right there, that's how you can, and then, you know, this is my, my favorite place to start this with. And I, I guess I would be remiss, uh, to not point this out, Drew, would be, uh, the headroom control does affect what we're listening to here. So I've got a, it's normal headroom control. Yeah. If you wanted to drive it harder or less from here, this is, you know, obviously you can come down you could use the mix knob to kind of blend in some of the dry signal, uh, that's unaffected, but you can also use this headroom control to to change the reference point of the unit, basically changing where does it start distorting? Does it, is yep. it at minus 18, minus 20? You know, you can change that reference level using the headroom control, and this is on a lot of these plugins. So if you're finding that you're not getting enough out of it, if your you know, input signal is a little too low, or uh, you just want to you know not always dime it out, you could you know in theory you could pull back this input and then maybe lower the headroom a little bit, and it would be a, a similar effect. Uh, yeah, and I like I really like that on the Fairchild. The Fairchild to me, mm -hmm. I I always just dime the headroom screw and just all the way full to the right, and it just pushes into the model even harder. And uh, yeah, and it's I love it there. I love what the that headroom screw does there. But yeah, you're right. It, it allows you to have the knobs in more sane positions and sort of you know gain stage in and out of it more mm -hmm. easily. Uh, good question here from No No. I know the basic answer is always use your ears. Yes, you're, I'm glad you know the answer to the question before you asked it. <laughs> but when you are about to choose a plugin, are you aware of your target as second or third order harmonics? Um, not clear on your mind before you're applying. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I don't. Uh, I personally don't <laughs> no, no, think. No, no. I don't no, think. No, 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 no. Ah, no, no, no. uh, <laughs> stop saying. Uh, never mind. Uh, no, it is not a, it's, I'm not going into these things like, oh, I want some second order. Oh, I want some third order. As Drew showed you in the, in the first part of the show, even the ones when it's saying it's mainly second or when it's a, you know, say a tube or a tape machine that you would associate with a certain flavor of, uh, of harmonics, the other one's still in there too. So the, the, basically none of these processors will give you a pure second or third order harmonic. So instead of thinking about it in these kind of numerical terms or like, oh, I want to add this sort of thing. It purely comes down to like, I'm going to pick the culture vulture. I'm going to put it in the Pento 2 because I remember it had this cool square wavy thing that I'm looking for to like really gnarly this up. Or I'm going to get to like a drum, uh, a drum beat like this one. I'm like, oh, I want to kind of lo fi it out. I'm going to pull out the Moog filter. Like, it's a lot more of like where my the destinations I've visited before sonically, what has gotten me there. And, you know, it's just kind of remembering in the moment, oh, this drum loop's kind of cool, but it's missing a vibe. 
okay, Moog filter is probably the vibe I want to add to it today. Um, and yeah. You know, so yeah, it's not really thinking about one thing or another. It's it's the ultimate destination that and knowing knowing your tools well enough to know which one I'm going to pull out to to satisfy that. Yeah, that's the key. And Ben, if you just if you show my screen real quick, you can see here mm -hmm. I I switched over to the Studer. And, you know, some people m might be surprised that tape is a bit more on is on the odd side. Right. So you can see yeah. here that, you know, we have the fundamental. There's some there's some second order harmonics, but here's 3K and 5K and so forth. So tape is a bit more on the odd side. Of course, you know, like as Ben said, everything kind of all the analog stuff generally had had a, a little mixture of everything. It's just which way it leaned one way or the other. But really, it's all about like I, I you know, I happen to enjoy visualization tools like this. They help me to sort of understand what's going on under the hood. But then, of course, you marry it up with listening sessions and you play around with stuff. Right. So if, if you're a working engineer, producer, artist and and you're with, you know, carve out a couple hours a week of just playtime where it's pure playtime. Yeah. Listen to stuff, run through all of your, you know, run through all of your plugins, like re reanalyze them, re, you know, re, re uh, invigorate yourself with them. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and uh, it, it's, it's definitely, it takes some work, right. To really, and then like Ben said, you'll just know intuitively you'll hear a sound, right. To me, that's what engineering is. It's, it's listening, making some sort of determination and then acting. And your brain is just on that loop over and over and over again. You yep. hear something and you say, Oh, it's missing this. And I know the tool that's going to give me that. So it's a yin and yang, mm -hmm. you know, react, you know, listen and react kind of thing. Totally. And that way, that way you're not stuck trying to intellectualize it or like over, you know, and this is yeah. something I, I see a lot of engineers, a lot of, it, a lot of artists just in general, right? You get into like over analyzing or overthinking your choices rather than like being like, ah, oh, I'm missing this. Oh yeah. I remember this thing gave it to me that one time. Is that cool? Yeah, it's cool. All right, moving on. Like, because there's, uh, in the end of the day, like, there are so many more things for us to worry about uh, with getting balances, stereo width, reverb. There's so many things that you're having to manage when you're mixing music. Yeah. Uh, worrying about which saturation plugin works best. You know, the advice is always going to be grab the one that you're familiar with, grab the one that is getting you to the sound that you kind of heard you wanted to have, and then keep moving uh, because you got, ain't no time to just sit there and, Drew, I love your suggestion though of like dedicating some play time, dedicating some learning time to be deliberate. Yeah. And you know, they call this deliberate practice where you're going to sit down and say, All right, I need to know the Studer plugin better. I need to, like, I want to know, like, in my core what each of these different tape types are, are doing. And you can spend an hour just <clears> running <throat> some of your favorite tracks through it, running old mixes that you have, running, you know, even people's released music through it, like stuff that you're familiar with, run it through these effects. And start kind of learning what's the GP9 versus the 256. Where do I hear the difference? Why would I pick this one over that one? Oh, you know, and like over time, it just helps develop your ear and also helps them develop your intuition about what tool to pull out in the moment. Um, which I think, Drew, that kind of leads us straight into talking a little bit about tape. And, and I, I do want to convey a little bit of like the tape process for a lot of folks. You know, you can put it on a bus, right? You can put it on a single track. But a yeah. lot of the power for for tape, and you know, and again, talking back to the the musical culture, the sonic culture that we all have, we're used to hearing multi track recordings being recorded onto a twenty four track Studer machine, and then played back yeah. off that machine, recorded onto an ATR one hundred two. So one of the great ways to get to that sort of result is to stack up and use multiple, use a little bit of tape on lots of tracks, and then you don't have to like you don't have to slam any of them you just kind of use them yeah. in their natural state and then they add a little something they add this a little bit of harmonic and the saturation to your, broadly across a multi-track yeah yeah so yeah so this you know this this is a i just have this quick little uh i just wanted to stay in this one same session so i just switched over to uh, adding some tape onto some drums um and just so you know what i've done here is i've got if, if uh, i'm in luna and here and if you right click on your group settings Mm -hmm. And you have, um, you know, you tie the inserts together. I happen to be using a, a the, the the DSP version just because it's a it's a little quicker on the AB. Um, but I've got it I've got it set up to where this one is uh, gonna when I change one they all change is is what's happening here. Nice. Um, so yeah, so let's start off let's start off with um, we'll start off, I guess we'll start with them off right. So we'll start with with the, I'll play a little bit of that same drum thing I was using before. And we'll put it on. You 
put it off. Right, and we're, you know we're getting that we're getting that kind of glue, right? A lot of it's people a, think of that. I was like, it's the same. We've heard, yeah. we, we've heard this effect now a few times today, right, guys? Like you just heard kick, snare, the the fundamentals of things become more apparent, which mm -hmm. that tracks with everything we've been talking about, right? The fundamentals and change become in more, top end, mm -hmm. yeah, and a change in top end. Like there's just something that kind of the tape just sort of shifts around there that that glues things together and does a little that little weird shift, and then you know. Uh, the other thing that it happens quite often is what we call the head bump, right? And this yep. was an anomaly, you know, an anomaly with tape machines that in and around, it has to do with the actual depth or the thickness rather of the opening for where the dielectric is. In other words, where the, the, the head stack, where the audio has to jump across and get onto the tape. Um, and yeah, there was like this weird anomaly that happened at that head bump. That's why they call it the head bump because it's basically tied to the geometry of the head. Um, and it would change with speed. So as you went faster and slower, your head bump would move up and down. So, you know, 30 inches per 50 inches per 15 inches per second had this more distinct head bump and a 30 had, um, you know, a different kind of head bump. So, mm -hmm. um, well, and this is why as, like, to, you know, to, to your point there, Drew, like, this is why like each one of those settings changes the sound so much. And it, and, uh, we've yeah. got a, we've got a great clip coming out, uh, very, very soon here. Uh, Jakir King kind of walked us through, the, th the main settings inside the studer uh, and this was back during the I think it was the API show uh, where we were we were, ended up on the topic talking about studer because he used it across almost every track in the session and he gave yeah. a great breakdown in that video and I'll make sure I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put, jump this one to the head of the queue for you guys so it's out this week uh, but basically the tape type inches per second and the calibration mm -hmm. and how the balancing these three settings ultimately delivers what sort of tone you want across your your record yeah, yeah, the calibration is super important because it has to do with the amount of fluxivity that are, you know, which is, you know, if you want to get really nerdy, measured in nano webers per meter. And essentially the higher you have, the, the, these plus numbers determine that the machine is putting more fluxivity onto the tape, which sat means it's going to saturate harder and sooner and faster. Mm -hmm. um, this is something pe this is something people used to do to tape machines, uh, you know, as we got higher uh, grade form tape formulations, you could then hit it with more signal before it broke up. And so people got, and that got you away from the noise floor as well. And yeah, and the tape formulations are really cool. So, you know, it, it, this is just a great, you talked about that play time, right? That structured play time, like mm -hmm. literally just throw this on here um, across grouped tracks, right? And if you make sure your group contains the inserts, then the change will occur to everything. You can also gang together the controls, uh, which is built into the plugin. You can gang those controls together. I just happen to be using Luna's uh, version of, of linking those and then the, the inches per second right for me like you know I, I happen to be on drums here but like seven and a half inches per second is like a 20 percent of a de -esser, right mm -hmm. you've got a vocal if you have a vocal that's thin and kind of essy you know run it through studer seven and a half inches per second you know and push it drive it in a little bit you're going to get you're going to get a pleasing thing and and s some subtle de to it um yeah so lo all sorts of great stuff that, that can be done here from really subtle to really extreme um Tons of fun yeah, nice. in this plugin for sure. Awesome. All right. So now we've covered tubes, we've covered FETs, we've covered tape. Uh, last one we're kind of working our way into here, arguably the, one of the more subtle ones, is uh, transformers. Uh, so I wanted to show you a couple of different ones that I think illustrate this really nicely. Uh, first is the, the Fairchild 670. This thing, uh, if you guys have never seen photos of this in real life, it is, it looks on the screen, it looks very reasonable and manageable in real life. The thing is a monster and it weighs <laughs> more than a, a high schooler. It is, it is, <laughs> it's so heavy. The reason why it's so heavy, it has so many transformers and tubes. It, the circuitry of this is so overbuilt. Great thing about the UAD model of the Fairchild is that it has every one of those is accounted for. And, and, and so you're getting all of the same sort of saturation characteristics and it just the the little interactions that happen between the tubes transformers is kind of what makes this a magical box so i'm not doing anything super crazy here this is the the drew special dime the input gain all the way up so we're <laughs> driving into it as hard as possible and then i just brought the threshold till it was doing a little gentle bus compression uh and you know we a couple of weeks ago we did a, a whole episode talking about bus compressors uh so if you want if you want to learn more about bus compression Go watch that show but for now what we're going to focus on is is the tone that this imparts onto a track so uh, listen less don't worry about the compression of it guys like again we're, we're talking about harmon harmonics and saturation listen to what this does 
to uh, now I'm going to bring the the piano, the drums, and, and a bass in here as well to really help drive into uh, into this whole circuit. Listen to the differences in parts on across the whole mix, uh, even with a very reasonable amount of compression happening. So now we got all my elements, a little bit of saturation already happening on each part of this, but now bring it all together. I, mean, I love, I love the life that this is giving to it. Like it's already, as you guys can hear, I'm already, I left the saturation on all my elements inside this mix, but now just running all of them together harmoniously in this, in this Fairchild just does something, it just, it's like the icing on the cake. Like, Fairchild, you just... No, no words can describe just how important and how awesome the Fairchild can be on a mix like this. Um, yeah, it's super beautiful. And I just, just so you know, Ben, in case, mm -hmm. and for those of you not looking at the chat, I just threw a link to our deep dive as well. Cause we did it. We did. We talked about the Fairchild yeah. with bus compression a week or two ago, but back in March of this year, I think it was, we did a full deep dive walkthrough of every single knob and function of the Fairchild. I threw that in the chat. So if you're, if you're not nice. watching the YouTube chat, check that out real quick you can go there hell yeah uh so the fair child it's heavy this is uh, if you didn't hear the color of the fair child let us know uh because uh, that's to me it's it's plain it's very very apparent very very obvious what's doing <clears throat> the the little extra sheen that's adding extra little bit of weight a little bit of extra harmonic saturation going on but i wanted to com i wanted to compare this and contrast it to uh, something we ha we haven't shown in a little while, little while here, which is the uh, the Brainworks uh, the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor. <clears throat> in this one, Mastering Compressor, this is an awesome, awesome plugin as well. It's two different compress compressors in one. There's an optical compressor and a discrete compressor. But the thing I'm going to highlight for us today is that it also has switchable transformers. So you can go between nickel, iron, and steel transformers, uh, and in so I want you guys to close your eyes, use your ears, or maybe keep your eyes open so you can tell when I'm switching it. But you'll hear a little, you'll hear just a little click as I go between them, just like on the, on the real unit. But listen to the contour, the low end, the how it excites things up above it. Listen to how that changes as I rotate between the different transformer options. Uh, so let's take a listen. This is on nickel right now. So for this one, guys, I'm going to fully forgive you if you don't quite hear the difference between all three of those. It, it is remarkably subtle. Like the, It preserves a lot of the signal. This is not like a huge night and day difference. And this is why we wanted to do transformers last, because transformers typically are kind of the more subtle saturation, right? They, and a yeah. lot of times the way you get more out of them is by pushing even harder into them. And I'm being, I'm being incredibly reasonable uh, with the amount I'm pushing into the Shadow Hills right now. But you still will notice, I notice it a lot, especially when I go between the nickel and the steel. Listen to the hi-hat, the character of the hi-hat up, up top. And just how on steel it, it's a, it feels a little bit sharper, and on nickel it feels a little softer. I'll play it for you one more time. I'll just go between those two and see if you can pick out the same difference. This is on steel. Uh, check out the hi hats. The snare, the snare the contour changes a little bit as well.
everything's just yeah, it feels a little bit brighter, a little bit a little bit sharper. And of course, uh, you know, everyone who's following along at home, you guys know that I've got the Moog filter, so I'm I'm already canceling out a lot of high end frequencies. So this is a very dark, warm, dense mix to begin with. There's uh, so it's, which is good for being able to show you guys the effect of transforms because this is kind of helping us lift all that lower low end content and excite it a little bit more up to the audible region. Um, so yeah, that is kind of the effect of transformers. Again, I highly recommend guys doing some deliberate practice around, you know, picking, picking a compressor that you maybe already know, or maybe one that you're a little bit less familiar with and just throw it on a bunch of tracks and, and really kind of start to learn for yourself. Oh, I like the Fairchild when it's, you know, when I don't dime it, or maybe you love it when you do it, Mm -hmm. or like, you know, play around with those calibration screws. There's so many cool settings that uh, that unlock very different sounds inside of these plugins, Um, which I think is a great way to get to our last form of saturation, the most modern of all the forms (laughs) of saturation, uh, which is uh, clipping. So we've been, you know, we've talked about all these old, kind of running through old circuits, now yeah. with digital converters, with you know, there's this a new form of saturation. This is used a lot in mastering, guys. It's used a lot, kind of as you're recording things in. It's this thing called clipping, where uh, you go in and you clip your converter. Uh, as much as a lot of us might be allergic and just you know, adverse to like, ooh, I, why would I ever want to clip my converter? Go over, you know, go over the red. As we've shown here, like all these things, they have a sound to it, and. The musical culture, right? Drew is like we've we've sort of absorbed clipping yeah. as like a valid form of of saturation that it does yeah. have a sound, has a use as well. And let's be clear, some of I mean, some of this analog modeled stuff when you're driving it hard, you're cli- it's, it's clipping. You know, it, it's a type of clipping. So really, just because it's just because it's you know you're clipping modern gear doesn't make it any different or less than you know clipping or, or overdriving you know something because you, you know it's it's basically the same thing, just a different a modern take on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so like you had said, it's, you know, this is something that mastering engineers have known for a long time that when they have these really great sounding A to D converters, that rather than limiting their tracks with peak limiters, which have artifacts and stuff, it, it actually turns out that you, if you just drive into the converter and you clip into the converter, you know, it, it sort of tops off those waveforms. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like brick wall limiting without a gain reducing element component to it, right? I just, mean, it's, it's, so it's really, like off of the, it's just off of the TED. It's like we've, yeah, yeah. we've reached zero dB FS. Right. No more, please. Yeah. And it's, and it's such a, it's a quality, it's a high quality circuit that it can handle it and it can mm-hmm. take it and it just gives it sort of a, you know, a, an edge to it while, and while raising that average volume. And so, you know, we're not going to demonstrate that today, but like, but we can at least talk about like versions of that, you know, like a, a good, a good version of this. You know, we, we mentioned Joe Ciccarelli earlier, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, guys like him have been doing for a long time or just sort of just driving stuff really hard. Um, you know, certain consoles are known for, oh, it sounds better the harder you drive it, right? So, you know, you look at some people mixing and you've got, you're driving stuff really hard. So I figured I would just quickly show you the SSL uh, channel strip, which is a great candidate for it um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, we have a line input. Uh, we have the ability to, uh, to, to adjust the line input. So if, if you look here in the front of the module, we have a trim control. So right away we know, okay, oh, coming off of tape, right? Coming off of tape, if something was tracked a little low or, or, or the reverse, if something was tracked a little too hot, uh, you know, this is what we would do, you know, on a console would be, okay, let me just, get, let me just line trim that up a little bit. Um, well, what, what that allows you to do is that allows you to actually push more signal into the circuit, um, and, and it's kind of like, you know, uh, kind of like the, similar to what we spoke about earlier with headroom screws, just the ability to drive more signal into it. The other thing that you can do that's unique, and we've shown this before, but we'll, I can, you know, we'll show it again. And that is the idea that with this module, we have, we can do two things. I can hit the flip button. I can hit the flip button and then toggle the transformer in and out of, of the, uh, of, of the circuit. This is what, this what, what we allows. like. It's what we like to call the cheat code, guys. If yeah, <laughs> is it? Yeah, it, we've shown it, this. It's so good. Yeah, yeah. So we've shown this on the SSL, which is it's it's not quite as immediate on it's it's more subtle on the SSL. The one, if you really want to try it on one, that's the cheat code. As Ben said, was the the eighty eight RS. Eighty eight RS has the ability to run back through the mic pre, and it's it's pretty radical, like the change there. We've shown it before, but definitely, you know, check that out, but it's a similar process. So now I can put in a transformer yep. and of course now I'm going through the mic pre. So 
it, you know, very often when you do this, be careful when doing this, because as soon as you hit flip, you're going from a line level to mic level. 20 and dB so you're, extra. Right yeah. There. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to probably want to do this with the transport stopped and start with the trim button. I mean, I'm sorry, start with the pad in, and then you can raise up the gain. And basically what you want to do is go to a point where when you do this, it's, it's more or less unity gain. And then that's when you can really tell what you're, what you, that you've gained staged it appropriately through the mic pre. And of course you might want to say, Hey, uh, you know, let's go a little harder, you know? So yeah. you might want it to be, you know, you might want to drive in. That's where you're going to determine, am I actually driving more than I would be with the line input? So that's one thing to try. So right there, you're, you've got transformer in, in, in the SSL, which you normally wouldn't get unless you're coming into the mic input. Number one, number two, um, I have the ability to drive into that. Of course, all of this determines changes the gain staging through the entire plugin. So of course, make sure you get this do dialed in right, then dial in your compression settings because they'll 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 be they'll be impacted by it. But then, as far as the clipping side, let's take a look at the output fader. So you'll notice on some of our channel strips, uh, the SSL is one, the 88 RS is another. They have both an output fader, which is part of the model, and then they have this output uh, control. By the way, 1073, 1084 also do this. Um, you'll notice some, not all do, right? Helios and API Vision do not do this. And that's because this has to do with their their design and their topology. SSLs, uh, the Neves, they have the channel amp is post fader. So when I drive in, when I raise this fader up, I'm actually driving or saturating or clipping in, potentially clipping into the line amp on for a given channel. And then that allows me to have this digital trim afterwards. So on Helios and API, the, the topology is not like that. And so it just doesn't exist. Um, but anyway, at any rate, um, this is allowing you and I've got this ganged. So everything I'm doing on one channel, um, it's doing to all of my drums. So this would be the case with all of this, right? Um, and I realized I probably just messed up my settings, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the point is to have fun with it, right? Um, yeah. So let's just see what happens. Let's see, I, 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 this will probably, I don't know if this will work because I did just mess with those settings, but let's listen. A little hot. <laughs> so I'm gonna drive that a little bit and bring down the digital output. Yeah, that's that's good. That's back more back to where it was. So so now that I've got that situated, let's do another A B here. So what we have is relatively mild drums that um, potentially could benefit from some saturation slash clipping, and uh, I'm gonna do that by uh, by running it through these modules. So let's let's hear that again. You know, right on, you know, Ooh. might be, you know, uh -huh. might be right on the edge of for, for some people's taste. But but again, check it out. Hit, try it in context, you know, play well, around and, with it. And, um, and like, so the big, the big thing here, guys, it, if hopefully you're noticing this on Drew's screen, that's no compression. That's no EQ. All he was yeah, doing in nothing. that example is just going from the line amp into the mic amp, overdriving it a little bit with the transformer and engaged on the channel strip. Uh, having putting the VCA fader up a few dB, and then the yep. most important key to this, and the reason why we wanted to use this to talk about clipping, is this final output knob. And this is present on uh, SSL, the Neves, uh, the Helios, a bunch of our uh, different UAD plugins where you have multiple gain stages available to you. That final one, that's complete, completely clean digital gain. So Drew is driving, overdriving the circuit just very, very moderately in there which is great like this is a great real, real world example of like why just a subtle bit of pushing into your mic preamp pushing into the fader and then trimming it back at the end just adds this edge and this life to the sound um yeah. and that's 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 what saturation is all about guys it's about adding this little bit of extra life a little bit of extra energy to to your tracks i want to know how many people didn't have never noticed the <laughs> uad on the fader cap right <laughs> these little things in the berry i know a little little easter eggs right but, there i love it yeah um, so yeah that's i think i think that's a pretty good example of like yeah. that's you know that granted that's hard clipping and i was probably you know so i can imagine people out there thinking ah oh, that's you're that's a little too much it might have been it might have been but this is all to taste you know um exactly. but there was no no doubt that it added a 
sort of, you know, it just makes the makes it sound like the snap of the hand is just a little bit extra on those snare hits, you know? Mm-hmm. That's why I use that trick all the time for, like, lead vocals that don't quite have enough energy to them, to drums, to bait. Like, yeah. there's a lot of sources that that SSL or the Neve uh, trick can really work for just by passing it through those circuits and kind of driving them a touch. Um, so, guys, that's, that's saturation in a nutshell. Uh, we, you know, hopefully this was helpful to get your ears kind of wrapped around what is saturation what's distortion why it's good where to use it different ways to get to it um because it, it you know this is this is a bit of a wonderland i could spend like we've said it many times now we could spend yeah. hours playing around with these and and kind of exposing the, the subtle differences between you know that was i thought it was a great example going between the fairchild and the shadow hills similar yeah. similar sort of bus compressors super different sounds and so this is why you know when people ask like you know you know Honey, why do you have a hundred compressor plugins? What are they, what do you use all those plugins for? This is why it is because they all sound slightly different. They all have certain uses, and you know, certain mixes require a Fairchild. Other mixes require an API twenty five hundred. You had to pick and choose and use your experience and your taste to select the right plugin to do the job that you wanted to do. Uh, and yeah, I see lots of chat. Fatso, 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 Fatso is incredible. It's. Uh, I forgot to program it into any of our examples for today. We'll do a whole thing about the Fatso because you guys, you guys shout out the Fatso enough in the chat that we will definitely let's. It deserves its own space yeah, we'll give and it time. time. Uh, but to wrap up today's show, I do want to. We got a studio showdown. We're gonna we're continuing the season to highlight studio uh, pictures from you guys in the community. So if you are eager to possibly win a UA Live coffee mug, all you have to do is hashtag UA office hours on Instagram with a photo of your studio. We'll find it. We'll put it head to head with somebody else from the community. And one of you will win a UA live mug. Uh, we've, we've already had a couple of great studios uh, come in. And after last week's show, there was a lot of new submissions. So it, it took me a little while to find two that I felt were on equal footing. I, I always want this to be a fair fight, guys. I, I never want to put like a little you know, a little kitchen setup against, you know, a major studio. So today we've got two really beautiful labs, lots of gear going on, lots of cool vibes. Let's, let's dive in here. Let's, let's, let's go one by one. We'll kind of we'll check them out. We'll give them <clears> our, <throat> we'll give them our analysis and then we're going to give them a score. Uh, and we, you guys are also going to give them a score. So pay attention. Uh, first up, Don Adler. I recognize this name. I recognize oh, you, Don, Don, from the chat. Hey, Don. Yeah. Finally getting to see see your setup, uh, which is super cool. Uh, a lot going on here. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna break this down because there's a lot of really cool guitars, a lot of cool music tech gear all across the studio. Uh, shout out! You got Luna running here in the background, uh, I believe. Yeah, that's Luna. Yep. And so let's yeah let's zoom in here. We got do uh, this little. It's, they call it like a little resonator acoustic. Little, it's got a little lyre thing on it. Soft tube console one, a twin. Uh, it looks like twin. a X, like probably an X eight on the desk as well. A, mon- a Personas monitor station, Mac Mini satellite. Luna. Shout yeah. out to Don for five sets of monitors. That was, five <laughs> five sets of monitors. Drew, you, you, read, is, you, read, you read my mind right there. I was <laughs> did like, I, did the I? number one thing about the, that I was going to take away from the studio is like, Don, you got some, you got a, you got a crazy speaker matrix, my friend. I lo- so we got <laughs> Focal solos, uh, some Tenoys, I believe, an Oratone, JBL, right? Um, you got you got a smorgasbord of monitor options. Yeah, uh, sure does. So yeah, referencing you got plenty of speakers to reference on. Nice little little outboard kind of you know simple rack, a couple of outboard processors, a control surface. I see you're probably making use of that with the new Luna update. Uh, I love the, the a lot of acoustic guitars, which I really love to see. But also this fan fret acoustic. I bet that thing is really rad. Um, it's a it's a really cool setup. So yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, oh, Drew, we lost. Sorry, we lost your camera. Your battery died on your camera oh. there but oh boy either i don't know if, it, if it's an easy fix otherwise we'll just do the voice the voice of drew in the background there <laughs> uh Let's all right so guys in the chat give this a, i want to hear from you guys rating one to ten what would you rate don studio um i'm gonna go man this is this is a super nice space lots of speaker options you've done a lot in a small amount of space 
which I'd love to see. So I'm, I'm going to give that one a seven. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it an eight. Just, yeah. I mean, it just like, it just looks like a great creative space, you know, like that. And I think that that's like, you know, some people like, if that's your mind, you know, if you're more, if you lean more towards musician, like that's just like a musician's playground, kind of good creative space. So yeah, I'll give it, I'll give it a, mm-hmm. give it an eight. Oh, cool. Don's in the chat with us here today. So we're getting real time. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't right. sell some of the speakers. So you just help, you know what? That's a great philosophy. If you can't sell <laughs> yeah, them, just, is. <laughs> just hold on to them. And it's a harp guitar. That's what it is. Yeah. That, that ah, thing's okay. rad. Uh, all right. Matt's not here today, but he's still in the spreadsheet. So we're, we're going to give, uh, we're going to get, Matt's going to be an automatic seven today for both rooms. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, that evens I, I, it out, yeah. I think that's a fair way to handle it. Yeah. 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 All right. So from the chat, we got an eight, a seven, a nine for the harp and a five for the monitor. Is that Victor? You're, you're confusing <laughs> me, man. So that average is a seven, uh, eight, seven, 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 eight, seven and a half, eight, seven, eight, eight. Don, stop thinking about tomorrow. Eight, seven, eight. I'm gonna round up uh, from the chat. I think you guys that that think, feels like an yeah. eight. That feels like an eight. Yeah, I heard you say eight a lot. I heard. I heard, I felt like I said eight a lot as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, so total for th- of thirty for Don. That's a strong, strong score. That but is. We're going. He's going up against tracks all day from Atlanta, Georgia. And this room, this room's got some vibe. And by vibe, I mean it's got a lot of red light. Um, yeah, it does. It's got. But of course, again, we can see we got Luna, Luna on the desktop running uh, Native Instruments Machine as well. Looks like an iPad watching you or on a Zoom call, maybe doing a little collab there, virtual collab, streamer mic, couple, you know, the Arturia. This 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 person must be an, also a photographer. Right? Yeah, I mean, they got a bet. Right. It's a great, it's a great angle. It's a dark room. It's a, it's a dark, dark room too. It's a know? dark room. Yeah, you can develop <laughs> photos in here. You can develop beats. Uh, you can, you can kind of, you can make everything. We got, yeah, it looks like a GoPro on the desk, control surface as well. Uh, let's see, going across here, you got, so you got two machines. To uh, be interested to know how how he works with both of those. It looks like one was running inside of uh, Luna. Maybe one's on a dedicated machine or something uh, for sampling. Uh, but uh, calling up monitors here again, we got we got near fields and then we got big boys. Uh, I can I can only imagine how loud this room gets, and I'm sure it's a lot of fun to bump <laughs> bump tracks in there, man. Uh, but then of course you know end of the day you can pull it down onto the onto the small speakers and and evaluate and mix. Uh, acoustic guitar chilling there in the background. Looks like a, a water bottle down there. Yep, always always keep your lids on. Everyone, studio rule number one, lids on your water bottles, right, guys? Um, man, a really cool setup. Really, uh, Again, I'm a, I'm a sucker for vibe. I'm, I've, I'm in that LED camp as well. Late night, make the turn the studio red or purple or blue or whatever, whatever your vibe is. Um, I'm gonna give this one a seven as well. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it even. It, I can't I honestly can't pick between these two. So I'm I'm gonna keep it I'm gonna keep it fair and go seven. What would you give this one, Drew? Yeah, you know I think I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna give this a seven. I give gave, this one a seven. I gave okay. the other one an eight. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna drop down to seven. Okay, Matt was an automatic seven. So right. from the chat, it's a nine to tie, a ten to win. Love, let's see what the chat says here. Uh, tracks all day is here now. So eight Metropolis is hanging out with tracks all day right now. So giving Uh-oh. it an eight red rum, eight, I right, got eight. I think blue notes. I think that seven was for this one. Maybe seven and a half, two machines, fader ports and an iPad watching office hours. Oh, I love it. Tracks all day. Seven, eight. I missed the two fans. Oh, Don. Nice. Good call. Having the two fans on top of the X eight P. Seven, eight, eight and a half. Got the soundproofing. Good call. I did not notice the sound. We didn't really critique the soundproofing, but Traxel Day does have it. Um, a six, a ten. Traxel Day. I, I'm afraid you don't. I might not count your ten in your uh, <laughs> your thing here. So Zilla the Great giving it a nine, a seven. Ooh, mm, I, guys, mm. I feel this is averaging out to an eight right now. Yeah, I think so too. This is gonna mm. be the, this is gonna be the closest one yet. A, by a thirty to twenty nine. By wow. one point, guys. This mm. is the clo- closest studio showdown yet. But in the end, Don, congratulations! You you win uh, win today's studio showdown. You got a UA Live mug coming your way. Uh, 
really and i bet it's, it's the cool guitars kind of tipped it over the edge i would think I th- so it, on, the, on the studio side is pretty even right so yep exactly but yeah. guys those are amazing amazing uh amazing studios it's really fun to see what you guys are working with and you see a lot of familiar names and faces here in the chat uh so so glad to have you guys hanging out with us as always it's hashtag ua office hours to enter the studio showdown if you've got music you want to get featured in our upfront countdown just hit us up it's live at uaudio.com and uh if you guys you know throughout the week comment on the videos we're pulling out as you guys saw we're, we're pulling out our favorite comments every week uh but if you do need help or support uh obviously you know if it's something that actually needs support reach out to customer support on the ua website uh but you can also you'll find drew over on the facebook groups or on the uad forms uh you know and if you guys have got suggestion for shows etc you know we love hearing from you guys and knowing what you guys want to see next because we have a lot of fun you know geeking out and talking about that we can Drew, we just did a, over an hour and a half geeking out about saturation. Oh like, yeah. That's cutting it short. Like, I, we, yeah, I know. We could have done I know. That's fast. Yeah, I know. that's fast. We, we could spend all day talking about this stuff and hanging out with you guys and sharing knowledge, sharing inspiration. Uh, but we love receiving that in return. So if you guys have got ideas for shows or things you want to see us cover, let us know. We're always listening. And uh, I guess with that, guys, we'll see you guys back here next Monday. Everybody have a great week. Go out, make some music, and we'll catch you next time. Peace. Yeah. Should make a record. Totally. <laughs> <laughs>